Hey, how's it going, everybody? Welcome back to Pass Money. Y'all know who we are. We did this hundreds of times. You know who he is. You know who I am. So let's get it going. Um, all the time, you know, um, whenever I'm out and about, and you know, I always get you know potential real estate investors or everybody always talk about they want to get in real estate or you're just talking to family, friends, or you just set functions, and then people will tell you the the nuances of real estate that they don't understand. So in today's video, we're going to talk about different questions we hear that people ask us about, you know, real estate or, you know, having rental properties and maybe some issues that they run into and you'll see how we answer them. So I'll start it off. I'll ask Alex uh, one of the questions. Alex, one of the ones that I hear the most is, what do you do if the tenant doesn't pay rent? So what's the answer you got for that? So in that case, uh, for at least for, I'm sure you do it as well, but um, keeping six months of reserves. So keeping reserves in case that there's vacancy, in case that there's damages, you know, anything that you need to cover out of pocket in the time of, you know, a crisis event like this. So um, now if it's a multifamily, though, then I'm just speaking for single family. And if it's a multifamily, normally, you know, you might have one unit go empty or two, if I'm correct. And if it's a duplex, you know, hopefully the other unit can still cover that debt obligation. If it's a triplex, you can still probably see cash flow above if, you know, one unit's empty and so forth. So it would be, you know, if you're investing in multifamily, you should be covered. If you're not, then having reserves on hand and, you know, getting a tenant back in the unit. Um, one thing I just wanted to say. Your first answer, I, I believe more, is if you got multifamilies or or not. I mean, you're right, 100% right. If you're in a duplex, fourplex, you know, triplex, if you got one tenant that don't pay, then you have coverage. But you should never be 100% dependent on the mortgage is going to get paid if the tenants pay the rent. You should always have a cushion. You should, I mean, just in the account that your rental, your rental property is in, you should have about two to three months worth of mortgage payments just sitting there just in case you know tenants can be late anything life happens you know people can get laid off from their job the mortgage company ain't gonna hear oh the tenants didn't pay me so i can't pay so unlike you hear on social media that oh this is just your free cash flow you pay them you pay the mortgage and then you could just go spend the rest that's not true if you do that get i guarantee you bad stuff is going to happen when you have tenants so that's the first thing you do. You have to have a reserve to cover anything that might come up. But Alex, your, your points was spot on. <clears throat> so what would you say um, someone or what should someone do if, you know, something breaks? You know, you have a lot of roofs that just collapse. <laughs> Not collapse, but he's got. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So like Alex said, I, I'm the king of. If something breaks, I'm the king of it. Uh, just in the last two years, um, I've repaid. And mind you, I'm in Florida. I'm in the the hot parts of the country. You know, Florida, Texas, Oklahoma, Georgia. So all these places are hot. So going without AC is not a not an option. So I think in the last two years, I didn't replace about eight or nine AC units, and they're going about six thousand a pop. I mean, of course, I'd have had other issues, roofs, you know, car accidents, cars crashing and stuff. But the way I get the way I get over it is I set a reserve to the side. And what I mean by set a reserve to the side. So when cash flow comes into comes in for rental properties, I just build the reserve. I build the reserve. Now, if there's no telling how much. Uh, you know, something to cost, but you can guesstimate. I mean, me, I know AC is, you know, one of the things that has to happen. I know roofs have to happen. So what I'm trying to do, and I, all the roofs are not going to go out at the same time. Hopefully no more AC units go out in the next, you know, five, 10 years for me. But I'm estimating on the high end how much all this stuff will cost that I can't call the insurance, insurance company for. Like I can't call the insurance company if the roof is just getting old and I gotta replace it. I have to do it myself. So I'm guessing and I'm, you know, spitballing and I'm looking at the numbers and looking at the age of, you know, all the, you know, major appliances and stuff in the house. And I'm getting that number in my head. And then when I go, 
when I go replace something like AC units, I rebuild the reserve to cover that again. So let's just say my reserve account is 50000 If I go spend, you know, 15000 on these repairs, when the rents come in, the cash flow come in, I build the reserve again before I start putting money to other places and uses uh, elsewhere. But you have to have a reserve. I know, again, I know it's unlike what you hear on social media. It's all easy. It's all fun and games. And, oh, money just flying everywhere because you got tenants paying rent. Bad stuff will happen. I mean, just look at... Just look at your home. If you own a home right now, if you're renting right now, think of how many times you had to call the landlord. All those repairs, the landlord has to pay for. Your house. I mean, even if you're in a brand new house, stuff breaks. And then with tenants, I mean, I mean I've been lucky for the most part. I've had good quality tenants that care about the place they live, but not all tenants are like that. And then they don't care about the house. So if stuff is breaking in your house that you care about and you're very pristine and meticulous about it, Imagine if somebody, they're living in a place that they can't, they don't call theirs. They're not going to take the pride in it. So stuff is going to break. You have to be prepared for it. And that is the biggest part of being a landlord or real estate investor when you're holding long-term rental properties. Uh, Alex, I got another one for you. Um, what methods do you use? And this is, and you know, you hear it all the time. Oh, because everybody always want to go, you know, pace or they want, they, you know, they hear these different things on you know, YouTube shorts. Oh, no money down. No money down. I want to get real estate. I don't want to pay no money. You know, they want to do all the fancy owner finance this. There's nothing wrong with this stuff. But Alex, what is your answer when people say, oh, so how do you get the money to buy rental properties? So living real cheap. <laughs> um, so basically, you know, we we try to save and invest about, I mean, it, it just varies on the month, but 60 to 70% of our income. Um, and so, but we make that a dedication. I mean, like as soon as we get paid from anything, the first thing we're doing is investing, you know, I mean, so, and we're constantly saving and, you know, we use investment vehicles such as like the S&P 500 to give us a little extra boost towards, you know, the next property or the next uh, investment goal. But that's all it is. It's just making, you know, staying disciplined on continuing to save our money. Yeah. And, and Alex's philosophy is the same philosophy I use is we save our money. I mean, of course, now if we have a lot more coming in, but. We save around 80%, you know, 70, 80%, you know, depending on if it's a fancy steak in there somewhere, you know, and I always got to eat steak. But, um, but anyway, it's about 70, 75 to 80%. Let's just use that number to be on the safe side. And that's what we do. We live our first line item on our budget is investing. You have to tell your money what to do or your money is going to tell you what to do. So, and, you know, vehicles like Alex is talking about using investment vehicles, putting the money there, putting the money there on purpose, intentionally, every paycheck, every time. And then like with me, because my portfolio is bigger, then also have the cash flow coming in from uh, rental properties. So I use that as a vehicle to speed along the process. And Alex, you know, he's on the second property, but he'll start seeing the, the uh, income snowball will get bigger, bigger, faster. So He'll be buying properties at a more frequent rate because he will have the money to put down and do the next deal. The more properties you have, the more money. But that's what it is. It's just a snowball effect. My first rental property, I believe, my cash flow was only like $300 a month. So I was bringing in $300 a month and I was adding it to what we was already saving. And then I got another property. So then my next rental property, I'll just say $300 a month again. And then so now that's $600 a month plus what we're saving. So it gave me the ammunition to go get the next property. And then I keep adding, keep adding that cash flow. I don't go out there and just because there's money coming in, I just go find something else to buy. I don't see a new Birkin bag or red bottoms or things like that. I just use it. I use money as a tool to acquire other assets to make more money. Now, what you do with your money is on you. But if you want to grow a portfolio, that's how you do it. You keep grinding, you keep grinding, you keep grinding, you keep grinding, you keep grinding because eventually... You're going to have enough money to come in where you can keep doing deals and then you will have extra cash flow to go do whatever you want. And then that's the position we're in now where money can come in. I can store it for the next deal. I'm just waiting for the next deal. I've been looking and networking for those. And then we have extra money over. It's just like, like I said, we just, 
frugal with our money is nothing that, you know, we have other avenues and other income streams coming in where we don't need the money to go do anything special. So it's just money. That's how the money generates and sits there to do the next deal, do the next deal. And then the ultimate goal, I mean, depending on how big you want your portfolio, is to have the ability to, you can do a deal when you want to. And that's the, that's the key of the game. Absolutely. With all that being said, guys, if you like the video, hit the like button, leave a comment down below, share, subscribe, and we'll see you guys in the next video.